I think the problem is is that people don't like comparing trading to gambling because of the negative connotations of the word gambling. Two traders, Darren and Walter, pull back the curtain on profitable trading systems, consistent money management and profitable psychological triggers. Welcome to the Two Traders Podcast. Welcome to the Two Traders Podcast. Walter here. Hello, Darren. Hello, Walter. So we're we're talking about poker players. And I always love when we mix trading and gambling because that just gets people all riled up. <laughs> so the question, Darren, is, you know, po- professional poker players most often throw away their hands and wait for the very best hands to actually play them. What can traders learn from this? So uh, another analogy would be the fisherman that that uh, you know just sits on the pier or sits on the boat and just keeps waiting for a bite. Maybe throws back a bunch of fish and just waits for the one that he really wants. And you see this a lot with the guys that play in these poker tournaments. And I'd love to get your ideas on this. Yeah, well, I've got two thoughts slightly conflicting on this and the first one is obviously that they have a strategy they have a strategy and they're sticking to their rules so their strategy would be that they're going to wait for specific hands Um, you know you could you could argue the better hands before they're going to play because they know statistically that that is going to give them the edge you know, obviously in poker, you don't need to have a good hand to win because it's not about the hand you've got. It's about it's about how you play the hand. And, you know, there's elements of, of luck involved there as well. And the interesting thing when it comes to trading is that you could argue the same point, that people prefer to wait for specific setups because they believe that those setups have a statistical edge and they're part of their strategy and that in the long run is going to make them successful but there is another side to this coin which on a psychological level which is quite interesting for me and that is this idea of fear of future regret and I believe that there's a lot of traders out there who leave setups entry setups because they rely on doing some analysis on the setup at the time and I think some traders perhaps have look at too much information on the entry and try to be too picky and what happens is when you kind of overload the brain with too much information generally what it does is or generally what the trader is going to do is just do nothing. So there's kind of two sides to this coin. There's a positive side, which is they're sticking to their strategy and certain setups have a statistical edge based on their backtesting, what's happened in the past, and that's how they're trading. And the other side is they're leaving too much to discretion and then when setups come along, they're looking at the trend, they're looking at the previous price action, they're they're considering the fundamentals and the brain just gets overloaded and it can't make a, a, a good decision and then they do nothing. That's that's kind of what I see happening. Right. So can you talk a little bit about more, what does it mean when you say leaving too much, so, much to discretion? Um, I think w- when we're trying to make a difficult decision, okay, and there's something riding on it, so we've, we're kind of emotionally involved in the outcome of that decision okay we want it to go a specific way if you have too many bits of information to consider what they find is happen happens is uh investors and traders they just do nothing and that's exasperated by the fact that we're constantly told that sometimes the best trade is just to do nothing so we automatically believe that leaving trades in some way an advantage and it's not it's only an advantage at, at the right times so, you know, your right and wrong times to trade need to have a, a statistical edge. So I think it's that overload of information where let's say you're, you trade a change in trend. Um, what people 
tend to do uh, or what a lot of people tend to do is have having one elements to decide that the, the trend has changed where really they'd probably be better off with just having one simple rule to say you know one or two simple rules and and what we try to do to try and Im- improve our results is we add too many elements and, and and the brain just cannot deal with that at those difficult decision times you might disagree with me but that's that's what i've read and and that's what i feel happens personally and i think it happens to a lot of traders yeah no i think i think there's a miss a, a misconception in terms of essentially what you're talking about which is when when people are under stress we always hear the term f- flight or fight but it's not that's not true i agree it's freeze it's freeze or fight so if you think back to you know when you which is basically what you're saying people freeze up and if you've ever been in a situation where you were walking and you came up on a snake or a mountain lion or a bear or if you're ever in a trade that's gone really bad in maces it was like when i think back to when i first started trading and i did everything wrong um the Two most common mistakes were adding to a losing trade, which is basically fighting, and then freezing, which is having a losing trade. And instead of taking the stop, you keep moving that stop to give it, quote, a little bit more room, which to me is kind of a freeze. It's kind of a, it's like a no decision. It's like, I don't want this trade to end. I just want to kind of, you know, hopefully get, work my way out of this or something. You could argue that it's fighting, but I think it's, you know, you, you're just frozen. And And I've heard this from traders too, who they sit there and they they're taking these massive losses and you you talk to them and say why you know why don't you just get out of the trade like this is just it's becoming a catastrophic loss and they say i know i should but i can't and they're just frozen so i think yeah i think um th- th- that makes a lot of sense to me what you what you're saying i think when i think about the the poker hands thing or the the professional pokers players one thing one th- well one thing that was interesting is i met a um sort of a friend of a friend and she played poker she wasn't i mean she made money at it and she did well but she was um i wouldn't call her professional because she had another job and a lot of her friends in this poker world they were professional famous professional poker players in the united states and you know she was talking about all the time how you know well yeah there's some luck involved but why do the same guys keep winning <laughs> you know like well why do you know why does this keep happening that was sort of her argument and I, I don't know enough about po- I mean I know I know just enough to be dangerous but when I think about trading and poker what it reminds me of this idea of throwing it away is is taking losses taking losses throwing away your hand you're just taking a small loss right you're not adding to that loss and so these poker players just know when they've got a situation whether they can bluff and possibly win or if they've actually got a pretty good hand and they could possibly win and that's when they you know that's when they go for it and that's interesting to me because i i was talking to a trader last about a week ago at a at a like a a little you know mastermind session and his main problem was that he um knew that he should let his exit strategy play out uh, because it his whole system was a trend following system it depended on having some really big winners and yet he would often um, you know try and, and, and work come up with excuses and reasons why to get out of his trade early before his system told him to and of course what that meant was he missed out on the biggest trade of the year so so far this year which is you know um, three quarters of the way through he had one trade that would have been his huge winner for the year, and instead of following his you know simple trailing exit strategy rule, he didn't. He got out early, and you know that was the big one. Like that, you know, and and that's often the case with those sorts of strategies. You might only get one or two of those a year if you take it trading the higher time frame charts, and you really need to take advantage of those. So that kind of reminds me of that too, and I think. There's a lot to be learned from from this, you know, for, for traders. We can learn a lot from this approach of just throwing away, throwing away, throwing away, and knowing when you're on to something and really kind of milking that. It also kind of reminds me of adding to a winner. They throw away these losing hands or these hands that they don't really want to have anything to do with because they think they're probably going to be losing hands. And then they really milk the winning hands for all that they can. And that's when they kind of go in for the kill and try and take out their opponents in these these poker tournaments at least that's the way I, that's the way i see it yeah yeah and i think you know if you look deeper into it as well you could you know let's say there's a player that he hardly ever plays a hand he throws all of his hands away and then when he finally plays a hand everyone sees that 
you know, the, the, the flop comes and everyone sees that it's a great hand. So everyone else on the table now is thinking this guy only plays great hands. OK, now he's got if everyone buys into that, he's got an advantage over everyone else on the table now, because the next time he plays his hand, everyone's going to be presuming that it's a great hand so he can play a crap hand then. So it isn't just about in trading terms, it isn't just about waiting for premium setups. It's about finding an edge over the rest of the crowd, the other crowd. And, you know, I think that's the point that is is often missed. We kind of, we we always think one dimensionally about what, what's really going on with trading. And uh, essentially, you know, it's, it's not just about the chart. It's about what everyone else is going to be presuming from the chart. Um, not your own presumptions. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 spot on. I agree. I think I think if you can think in terms of what are the other traders thinking, that's a that's a really great way to do it. You know, like I always, I you know, I have this optimism bias as most people do, which is like you know, I you know, I overestimate um, you know how well things are going to go, and like I, I often think you know if I was a poker player i would where my edge would be would be in sort of reading the other people i think i would be quite good at that now that could be just a load of baloney and maybe it's not true but that's what i believe and you know i might try and work my edge off of trying to figure out whether so and so has actually got a really good hand or not you know whether the other dude is really bluffing or or, you know that that would be kind of you know it's funny how they wear like hats and glasses and everything to try and stop you from reading them (laughs) The whole thing is hilarious. I think it's great. It's great because it, I mean, it just sort of validates that they don't, you know, they don't want someone reading them. They don't want some. They don't want someone to know what they're thinking or trying to figure out what their tell is or whatever. You know, it's it's hilarious. But but um, building off that idea that you just shared, um, what about consider this in terms of trading? What if you have a, a trade, a particular trade, which isn't necessarily a good one? In other words. I would consider a good trade where you get into the trade and then relatively soon the market just takes off in your direction. But what if you had a trade where it wasn't actually a um, a, a, a great trade because you got in and the market kind of just kind of waffled around a bit and you were in drawdown and then you're in positive territory and then you're in drawdown again. You know, it's kind of going against you and for you. Would you say then that part of the skill and how it relates to this analogy of poker tournaments and poker players would be that you know it's possible like if i were in a trade and it's it's it goes it goes in my favor 30 pips and it goes against me 40 pips and then it goes in my favor uh 20 pips and then it goes against me 50 pips and then it goes in my favor 40 pips and it goes against me 15 pips if i'm able to positive actually turn that trade into a positive result, which would for me be not a loss, so either a break even or a positive result. You know, would that be kind of along the same lines of the skill of the player in terms of you know, as we're saying, the the poker player? Would you consider that to be, uh, you know, in the same ballpark? I think so, but I think those kind of tactics come down to like the individual trader. And I know you've done a webinar on this before. What you kind of need to decide what's going to um, what's going to hurt you more. Is it going to be okay? This trade hasn't really flown off, so I'm just going to take a small loss and 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 wait for the next setup. Okay, and then it races off in the direction. You know, are you going to be more annoyed that? you missed out on the possible winner or you're going to be more annoyed if you didn't get out and it it went and hit your stop loss you kind of have to sit in one camp or the other and I suppose if you could test if you tested a thousand scenarios of, of of that particular event and there was a clear edge to getting out of trades that don't go your way quickly and instantly then sure enough you know write that into your strategy but I think more what I think generally those sort of things tend to be 50 50 and what what's really more important is to decide which one's going to annoy you more you know me personally once I'm in a trade I let it do its thing because for me 
it's reducing those amount of decisions I have to make again. And I, I think that the more decisions you have to make, the harder it, it becomes to trade. But, you know, that's not to say that you can't just, you know, write a simple rule, you know, if it hasn't moved within a certain amount of time or something, then just, you know, cut your losses and wait for the next setup. I think, you know, the the confusion comes in the fact that we we think that those little things really make an edge and I think if there is an edge in those sort of decisions it's slim at most uh, and really what you're doing is is finding something that you can live with um, a type of trading that you're kind of happy with right well so why do you think these poker players or some of them that that become professionals and and make money and the other ones are sort of just um you know struggling and they they never really you know never really it's never really their deal. Like, what what would be some of the reasons why some of them are able to make it? Well, that's a good question. I think they probably have a good strategy to start with. And I think they have good psychology to go with it. And then there's an element of luck. I mean, it's, it's really the same as tra- trading. I think it's a strategy with a slight edge. Then, you know, really good uh, psychology. And uh, and then, you know, I, I think if you've got those two working, then, you know, you're going to get slightly more good luck than bad as well. Right. So if I were a poker player, I might do something where at the table, I might play twice. I might play my strongest hand. If I get a really strong hand, I'll play it, play it all the way through. And then from there on, I might consider bluffing, right, or something like that. So that's kind of my edge. I'm sort of building up my... Um, the belief of the of the players around me that I'm going to, for example, only play, like you said, like only play the strong hands. And then after that, now I have a little bit more leeway. I can I can change that up a bit. And um, it's sort of like a baseball pitcher who he throws the fastball, throws the fastball, and then all of a sudden he, he throws a change up, which is a really slow pitch. And the, the batter doesn't know what to do because it takes so long for the ball to get down there, you know, that sort of thing. So it's kind of the same thing where you just get someone conditioned that, okay this is what he's going to do this is what he's going to do and then you do something different is that is that fair to say like would that be do you, would you consider that an edge or not really uh, i think that's that must probably a good strategy but i think the money management side of it probably comes into it more for the tra- for the um poker players who win very often and over a long period of time you know if you're risking your whole pot to win big blinds all of the time you're going to win a lot of hands but, you know, the one time that, you know, the guy opposite you gets two aces, you're going to go all in and get blown out. And I think the good pay- poker players, they, you know, if, if there's not a lot to win there and your cat and, your, you know, hands OK, then I think they'll probably just fold their hand, you know. But the one time that someone else is going in with a lot of money and you've got a really good hand, then, you know, then they play it because the rewards are big. So I think on the money side, it's it's very similar to to trading. I think you need to you need to look at the risk to reward of each situation as well. Yep, and I find it fascinating that some of the the money management principles have come from gambling, like that that, that traders use. I think the famous book is the Thorpe book. I think his name is Ed Thorpe, called Beat the Dealer. If that's right, I'm not sure, but yeah. So. Beat the market. Oh, beat the dealer. Yeah. So he wrote a book called Beat the Dealer, and then he wrote a book called Beat the Market. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. I think I think you're absolutely right. So where is where is it? Where does it diverge? Where is it different for the poker player in a tournament versus the trader, the retail trader? Where is it different, if if at all? Well, I know we we both slightly disagree on this. I don't believe there is any difference at all. I really don't. You know. The, the poker player can control his risk to reward. He can control how much he uh, risks on uh, up to a point. I mean, obviously, these small blinds and uh, big blinds are already set. But for the trader, I suppose that's commission and spread. So the psychology is, is certainly very, very similar. And strategies as, as well. If you look at poker strategies, there's a lot of similarities. I think the problem is, is that People don't like comparing trading to gambling because of the negative connotations of the word gambling, that it's acting, you know, irrationally and it's acting, um, in, you know, it's, 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 being, it's being risky, you know. But, you know, the same could be said of, of trading. I know we slightly disagree on this, but for me, 
trading and gambling are, are, the, are the same things. Even roulette, you know, ru- roulette is the same thing, but you've got to appreciate with roulette that, you know, your odds are, are already fixed and, and you can't control, you can't really control that. You know, they're fixed, so the house has an edge. But in poker, nobody has an edge over you. It, everyone's playing on the same table. Right. Right. So, so if, so, okay. So what I'm trying to get you to say, Darren, <laughs> it's a, yeah. I'm trying to, what I'm trying, <laughs> what I'm trying to understand, because, okay. So my understanding is that when you approach trading, you say, look, there's really no, you don't really have an edge as a, as a uh, trader. Like, and, and, and when I say this, I mean like an entry edge. So you take a bunch of entries and you just try and manage these trades as best you can to eke out more profit than loss. Is that fair to say? I mean, that's essentially what... Yes. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's that's your approach. And uh, by the way, Adam did a great... I should just, um, make sure that you see the recording. I don't know if... You, Adam did a really good job of uh, presenting your trading strategy at the, at the London conference. Um, yeah, it was fascinating, you know, to see that. I'm, I'm particularly interested... Have you haven't seen it, have you? I haven't, no, but was it recorded? He did mention it to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll send you the recording. Yeah, I'll give you the recording because you did a great job. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what, what was interesting, my most interest to me, the most interesting aspect w- was the the hedging part because I think that's the most difficult part for people to understand, and in, including myself. But I diverge anyway. The point is, you you're basically saying this. Yep, there's no edge. Nobody has an edge. It's all an illusion. And so when you get into a trade, you need to manage the the winners as best you can and make those count. Right. That's essentially what you're saying. So. Is it the same thing with these gamblers, these professional poker players who go into the tournament, they're playing at a table, they don't really have an edge, or do they? Well, statistically, you can prove that certain hands have a greater chance of winning than others. Um, that's, that's obvious. If someone's got two aces and another person's got two threes, he does have an edge there based on the cards but there's no saying that but you don't know that he's got two threes and there's no saying that he can't bet in such bet you out of the game he can you know he could bet in such a way that you start thinking well this guy's got a flush or something or so that element comes into it and i think the same happens in trading you know we will convince ourselves that a certain price action setup is is guaranteed to win and and you know then it all turn around and and stop you straight out yeah yeah no I, I i'm with you yeah i get it um and so like so so yeah so like i'm thinking of the trader so there's there are some traders who are very quantitative focused like that's their the, the way they approach it and they do things like they say look Every time the market gets to the, if you're looking at, for example, pivot points, they say, look, whenever the market gets to R3 or S3, which is the furthest pivot point, it's almost always going to retract from that and pull back. Like it's very unusual that it would keep, they will have the stats and they will show those stats. And just like you can have stats for certain hands in poker and blackjack and all that, you can say, you know, whatever, this is, you know, this is going to win X number of times or whatever, they'll do the same thing with trading. And I guess what I'm trying to figure out here is uh, we're fooling ourselves, right? Like, I mean, yeah, you are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess in, in poker, it's a closed system, isn't it? Because in poker, you know what cards are available. Like, you know what a deck has in it. And I guess with trading, it isn't uh, what I'm trying to do is just fish out what the difference is here. And, um, and, and I guess that's what it is. I guess that's it, isn't it? Like in trading, there is unlimited volatility, essentially. Theoretically, there's unlimited volatility. The market goes as far as it wants to, whereas you've only got 52 cards in a deck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, the problem with the, you know, with, with the analogy you made about pivot points, okay. So, okay, it always retraces from R3, okay, but... How far through R3 did it go? How far have you got to put your stop? And then how far did it retrace? I mean, if you held it all year, did it retrace 3,000 pips? How much are you going to take out of that retrace? You, you have to have those elements as well. 
That's all the time we have for today's episode, episode 105 of The Two Traders. However, in the next episode, you will get the double ace of diamonds card and how that affects traders. You'll also see how Darren uses the poker player exit strategy with his trading and why he does this. You will get the problem with really big winning trades. And this can drive many traders crazy, but it really shouldn't, and you'll see why. You'll also get why focusing on making the, quote, best decision may not be the most profitable way to trade. And finally, you will see the poker player's rule in the next episode. And this can help every trader who pays attention to this rule. It's a little golden nugget of truth, and I hope that you find it useful for your trading. All of this and more in part two, episode 106 of The Two Traders. See you next time.